So this is the second part of our um, hopefully ongoing series with John Bavaki and Jordan Greenhall, which was really fascinating. We caught up for about an hour a couple of weeks ago. And where we got to at that point was, John, I think you were just asking Jordan about his concept of simulated thinking. Yeah. Um, simulated thinking versus genuine thinking and how that maps onto your concept of bullshit. Do you want right. to introduce your concept of bullshit, John? Um, and then, yeah. then maybe Jordan yeah. can pick up and say if there are any parallels between the two. Yeah, so the con, thanks, David. And it's good to see you again, Jordan. Um, the, uh, the context was uh, Jordan had given a very uh, clear exposition of, uh, you, you know, um, his take. I had spoken about the meaning crisis and the mental fog, and then he had talked about how that crisis uh, can be exemplified in a personal way. And then that brought up this, uh, this idea of pe people getting into a mental uh, a fog and what, um, how that plays out. And then he introduced the distinction uh, while uh, discussing uh, that state uh, between simulated thinking and I believe he said real thinking. And that, that really struck a chord with me uh, because um, that seems to connect to uh, some really important ideas, you know, Heidegger's idea about, you know, real thinking as opposed to just getting caught up in the, the cultural code. Uh, and then it, it and that uh, that has had an influence on my thinking about this idea of self-deception and bullshitting uh, oneself. And that, the idea is taken from uh, Harry Frankfurt's work, his seminal essay on bullshit, in which Frankfurt made uh, uh, an important distinction between lying and bullshitting. Um, this is relevant in two ways because, uh, as he pointed out in uh, the, the essays, what I think twenty years old now. You know, everybody senses that bullshit is rising. And I think that's one of the symptoms of the meaning crisis. So at a cultural level, it's important. Uh, but I think it's also important for self-deception. And when I, uh, I, let me explain why. So the liar is committed to manipulating you by your commitment to the truth of your beliefs. So if I get you to believe that Susan loves you when she doesn't, I can manipulate your behavior accordingly because you're committed uh, to acting on the basis of uh, the truth, okay? Now, Frankfurt pointed out that unlike the liar, the bullshit artist doesn't work that way. The bullshit artist manipulates you by getting you indifferent to whether or not something is true. And then I, I, I sort of developed that a little bit by something that I think is strongly implied in Frankfurt's work, which is the bullshit uh, artist manipulates you by not only getting you indifferent to the truth, but by getting you caught up in the salience of what's being said, how catchy it is. Um, and so a prototypical example of this is political discourse or uh, advertising mm -hmm. in which the advertiser presents something that you know is not true. You see somebody drinking alcohol in a bar, right? And they're immediately surrounded by happy, attractive people. Uh, and with that, I, I've never seen that in a bar in my life. Um, and everybody knows it's not true. And that's important because right away, right? You think, oh, well, I know that's not true. But you're actually losing in that game because now you're indifferent to whether or not it's true. And the thing that matters is, right, the alcohol has been made salient to you by its association with sexuality, success, and you go out and buy the alcohol. That's precisely why the advertisers pour all the money in. Now that's a prototypical instance of, of, of bullshit because you're made indifferent to the truth and then you're caught up in salient. Now why is that relevant to self-deception? And this is why I think it might tie in with Jordan's uh, distinction. I take it that you can't, uh, and there's a lot of philosophers who argue about this, uh, and, and I think many of them come to the, a similar conclusion. You can't really lie to yourself. You can't say, well, I know Susan doesn't love me, but I'll say it. And you know, Because saying something to yourself isn't the same thing as believing it. Believing is not something you can do as an act of will. You can desire, you can hope, you can will, but you can't just sort of make yourself believe. And then... That's important because then the common metaphor we have, which sort of situates us at the propositional level, I think incorrectly for self-deception is we lie to ourselves. Whereas I think what we do is bullshit ourselves because while we can't directly manipulate belief, what we can directly manipulate with our attention is salience. I can make something salient to you just by getting you to attend to it. Like, you know, how's your right hand doing right now? Now it's salient to you. 
it stands out for you, it gets your attention. But the trick, the interesting thing about attention is it's not only something we direct, it's something that grabs us. So also if, if something is salient to you, it grabs your attention. And so attention has this self-organizing capacity, which makes it tremendously adaptive, but it also makes it liable in this following fashion. You know, the advertiser directs your attention towards the alcohol and these other stimuli. That makes the alcohol more salient to you. That's going to catch your attention more often, which makes it more salient to you. And then you get deceived. And you can do the same thing with yourself. You can deceive yourself by, getting a, by not paying attention to how you're paying attention. You can get caught up in this deleterious um, self-organization of your attention that gets you caught in this sort of salient spiral. And that leads you to have your behavior directed in a way in which the salience of the information is being disconnected from your evaluation of its truth, its realness, um, its moral goodness, etc. And I find that this is a pervasive uh, pattern in a lot of people's cognition. I think when you're looking into a, a lot of what uh, therapists are working with, they're often trying to break out of uh, salience misdirection. I'll just t talk for one more minute, and I think that'll help give Jordan a lot to work with. So one of, one of the things I talk about when, when people are doing therapeutic work is aspect disguise. So here's a prototypical example. Uh, somebody comes into the therapy and they know, oh, you know, I have a problem. I'm too stubborn. Everybody says I'm too stubborn. I, I got to change my stubbornness. And the therapist says, okay, and you, and you talk and you go away and, and you come around and you say, tell me something you really like about yourself. Like you really identify with it. Oh, I'm really persistent. I stick with things and I keep going no matter what. And it's like, hmm. So what's happening is they're, they're, they're actually talking about the same thing without realizing it because they're ch changing the salience of this particular mental feature, right? And, and when, they, when they're seeking help, they're picking up on the negative, they're making salient the negative features. But when they're identifying, right, they're picking up on the positive features. And so they, they bullshit themselves in that way. And so I'm trying to give a couple of very concrete examples for you to work with, Jordan. That's what I mean by bullshitting yourself and how it's working at this attentional level and the level at which we're sort of creating our identities in our interactions. Wow, that's great. Uh, that was, um, I, I felt as we went through there, I actually felt there was a journey in just that little tiny bit setting up the, the larger story. Um, my, my sense is that there's actually something very interesting to be found here. The, the, the physical shape of it, it almost feels like a, um, like a particular geometry. Mm. Um, and I notice I'm actually a little bit, um, a little bit abashed. It feels like it's maybe more than, than I feel that at least I personally can, can grasp, but I'm also excited to see if, if by venturing in that direction, something actually emerges between us, which would be wonderful. Good. Um, and I expect that if it does, it'll be largely uh, because you're here, because <laughs> this is definitely a place where, um, well, you, you know what you're talking about. I'm sort of punching vigorously in the direction. So the distinction that, that I tried to make in this concept, um, simulated thinking and just real thinking, actually was based in the, in the, in the in the conversation or in the way that I expressed it on a more foundational distinction between um, habit mode mm. and explore mode. And so the, the notion is that there's an in normal thinking, there's a, a fluid relationship between habit mode and explore mode where um, those, those aspects of life that are most, that can be pattern recognized as being more or less identical to circumstances that we've dealt with in the past and therefore can be addressed effectively using um, well-worn habits um, are the appropriate domain of habit mode. Uh, mm -hmm. I've actually learned that apparently Brits notice that Americans, because we've been driving more and longer, drive in habit mode in a way that's actually a little bit frightening. Um, <laughs> right, will right, right. talk and think uh, while driving in a way that isn't ordinary for them. Right, right. And then, of course, we have explore mode, right, where we're, we're quite specifically not um, allowing what's happening to be run into habits of thinking and habits of acting, but rather are moving more slowly through experience and paying attention in a more open-ended way, seeking potential patterns 
that may or may not be arising um, for which to respond. Because this is ordinary thinking. Mm -hmm. And the notion that I propose that there's this um, kind of an eddy that, that thought can enter into when there's a particular form of habit mode that presents itself as being seeking mode ah. and then begins the process of eating the normal fluid relationships that we find ourselves in habit mode and thinking that we're thinking normally. And now we are now in simulated thinking. Uh, let, me, uh, let me see if I can point it to some specific uh, cognitive mechanisms that I'm aware of. And I, I think they fit into the model you just put. So let's say uh, a good example of uh, simulated thinking in which habit thinking, I'm trying to use your terms carefully here, is being extended into what looks like exploration but isn't, would be something like the confirmation bias. Mm. The confirmation bias is you look like you're exploring, but you're not really exploring because you're only looking for information that will already confirm your beliefs. You won't look for any information that will actually challenge it. So while it looks like you're doing research or exploring, you're actually not doing that. You're actually just reinforcing uh, the beliefs you have because you're, you're falling prey to the confirmation bias. And then, of course, this is one of the things that drives echo chambering in social media. It just reinforces it uh, very, very quickly. And that strikes me as a, a good instance of what you're talking about, because, of course, you should look for confirmation uh, when you're doing exploration. But, right, but it's a bias precisely because it only makes the confirming evidence salient and you don't direct attention towards something that might disconfirm your belief. And so that's a prototypical instance of bullshitting yourself. And so the confirmation bias would be a, a, a linchpin between sort of habit thinking, pretending to be exploratory thinking, that is also quintessentially an instance of bullshit. Uh, are you familiar with, with uh, the work, uh, a Tainter, Joseph Tainter's work and the Tainter curve? No. All right, this is, this, I think this is gonna be badass. All right, check this out. So, <laughs> Tainter's work is um, anthropological. So he takes a look at it. The book, the, the big book, the main book is the, the Collapse of Complex Societies. Oh, I so, have his book. I ha I'm, I'm, I'm going to read it, but I, haven't, I know nothing about it. I'm ignorant, but oh. I, I'm interested in it. I, I, I've got the book and I want to read it. Okay, but go ahead. It's on the top five, top five list. Um, so spoiler alert, but I, okay. I'm that's, that's fine. That's fine. The, the proposition is here is that in, in the context of a a society, so a group of people who are working together and communicating with each other and building uh, an increasingly sophisticated uh, capacity to engage in a certain uh, exploration of technology in relationship to a given resource. Right. So learning how to uh, extract petroleum better. Or bronze and in the Bronze Age or something like that. Bronze in the Bronze Age, uh, food, uh, corn in the, right. in the Mayan Empire. Right, right. Um, and, what, and what you see is there's there's actually, it's, it's, it's really an amazing thing that he was able to suss out because there's, there's two distinct drivers that happen ha simultaneous and these curves are superimposed on each other. Mm -hmm. So one has to do with a series of what are now pretty well understood S curves that are associated with what happens when you're engaging in uh, uh, innovation. Right. So innovation has a characteristic of, of exploring for a while with little upside until it hits some set of, of, structures that seem to work and then it exploits those structures and you get an acceleration and then you kind of tapped out everything that you can yeah. uh, and kind of come to the top of the s-curve um you get the exact same curve in psychology when you're studying insight problem solving hmm. ha. well and i'm guessing for the same reason actually i'm yeah. guessing there's actually a uh, something fundamental about the nature of um, a particular mode of, exp of of being in relationship with reality sure yeah, you were, pro pro you were proposing an isomorphism. That's what we're exploring. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so, awesome. Okay, so, so in, in the Tainter thing, what you have is, <clears throat> on the one hand, you've got that dynamic. So uh, in the beginning, you have, uh, sorry, and, and then on the other hand, you have the dynamic of the, uh, some relatively increasing difficulty of getting access to the resource under the uh, uh, low-hanging fruit right. framework. Yeah. Right? So right, in the right. beginning, while your technology for extracting petroleum really sucks, petroleum is relatively easy to get. Right, right. Uh, so you've got like X capacity. Uh, and then you, you increase your technology and, and petroleum is still relatively easy to get. So you actually get a significant increase on X. But right. then you've harvested all the low-hanging fruit. And so what you're noticing is a, 
it's harder to get because you're actually getting all the low hanging fruits. Your technology has to get better to keep up, but you still got a lot of room in improvement of technology. So your technology does get better. In fact, it gets a lot better. So you don't just keep up, you actually accelerate. So you see this acceleration curve. Right. Um, But what ends up happening is as you begin to move up the S curve in technology, you're also beginning to cross what is a, uh, obviously it very much depends on the particular areas of the resource, but a different kind of curve that tends to have a depletion characteristic on the resource. Right. Um, and, and you're also taking the resource and making it more and more fundamental to the society itself. And this is the, that third piece is crucial. So you, you get to a point where you actually find yourself not just kind of liking or enjoying or, uh, uh-huh. being rewarded by investments in technology, you're suddenly in the Red Queen's race. We actually have, you must continue to actually increase your investment in technology just to keep pace. But you're still actually getting a positive return on investment in, in, uh, in R&D because there's still plenty of resource to find and there's still plenty of room in the technology curve. But you've right. hit a certain inflection point where you've moved from a highly, a very fluid seeking optionality to a, oh wait, now the society if we, if we start to slow down what we're doing, we're going to feel the pinch at the social right. level. We're going to feel an right. unpleasantness as the, you know, from the neurological level, the, the serotonin does not continue to flow. Right. Um, but then you start getting yourself into a real problem because as the technology begins to move through the curve, you're actually now having to increase the, the amount of investment just to continue to stay at pace. So now you've moved from an acceleration mode in, in the fundamental curve to a velocity mode. So acceleration is actually decreasing. Velocity is continuing to increase. So it still feels like you're getting a positive ROI. In fact, you are, but the acceleration is slowing down. And this is where you right. actually, in teacher's model, where you hit the key pivot point. Like right here is the point where society could shift. Like here's like, you know, uh, 1975, 1977 in oil in America. We're like, okay, right. now we've made a concerted effort to move consciously to a different infrastructure. We still have enough resource and enough uh, runway in technology sp- in innovation space. And we're still not so fully addicted to the resource that pivoting from an oil-based economy to an electro- electricity-based economy, while painful, is quite doable. Right. But generally speaking, and this is where the the... the similarity really rang from you. Generally speaking, you don't. Generally speaking, the cost of changing your mind and the ability to bullshit yourself into continuing down this road causes you not to almost ever as a society make the choice to switch at that point. Mm -hmm. So then you get yourself into the, the top of the curve where now the technology is beginning to show less and less return. So now we're, we're past, um, oil derricks in the, in the oceans in the 60s and 70s, now we're starting to get into the deep water horizon where you're actually having yeah. to drill, drill crazy deep to get return or fracking to be yeah. able to keep up. And the resource is now getting to the point where you're on the other side of the, of the Hubble curve in, in oil and you're actually getting depleting, uh, the resources are now getting past their, the peak. Right. Um, so you're having to really scramble. So technology is incredible just to keep pace. And right, right. of course, now you're really locked into something because the society has now made not just an investment in oil, it's made a massive investment in the capacity. Like think about how, how deeply in t- intertwined, and, and while you're doing this, think about this from a psychological and neurological level, right. how deeply intertwined things are like how the finance industry is connected to the petroleum industry and the distribution industry and the you know, universities that are producing technical degrees that are, are plugging into this infrastructure. And of course, the automotive industry and gasoline. I mean, this hugely complicated fabric of a massive commitment to something that is now in the Tainter story, reaching a point where it's no longer sustainable and you hit right. a crisis through one of multiple different pathways. Um, so then just take that same exact story and remap it to the story of bullshit and simulated thinking. And so I have a, uh, in simulated thinking, what I have is I have an, an, a reasonably optimized habit structure that right. is able to respond to life in some rapid and at least initially perhaps very effective way. Like a, a, right. the story that I like to use is just math. Right. So if the way we teach kids math, particularly uh, arithmetic, is through habit mode. Right? Right. I, I, it wasn't until I was in my early 30s before I actually grasped even multiplication. But mm-hmm. I could multiply. Right. I could be a calculator, 
but I could not, I didn't understand what was going on. Right. Um, so I've been given this tool that is very effective. And by the way, I can build more on, it. I can actually do physics on the basis of my capacity to be a calculator, even though I still don't understand what's actually happening. Sure. And I can build more and more on this infrastructure. And it's based on a certain ability of every individual human having a certain capacity to do certain things with a certain degree of precision and a certain degree of uh, reliability of uh, repeatability. And I right. can build more and more social fabric on top of that. Sure. Um, okay. Sorry. That's, I, I end there. There's more, but that's where I, I'm starting to tail off. Okay. So the idea is then that, um, let me, let me see. I'm going to explain back what I, I, uh, what I, what I heard you saying. Let me, let me see if I get it right. So the idea is you've got sort of something that is initially very adaptive and it's being used and it gets sort of automatic. That's, you know, automatic thinking, right? Because it's precisely because of, of its adaptivity. And then, um, you know, you, you build more and more on top of that foundation, the way more and more of American culture and industry was built on top of the petroleum, right? But as you get more and more committed to it, its ability to extract reward from the environment starts to decrease because the world, right, has limited resources, it's dynamically changing. And so you have to invest more and more in getting what you used to get from it. And then the idea is at some point, right, something like diminishing returns sets in, and now you're into a situation where you're sort of catastrophically committed to something that is ultimately doomed to fail. Is, is, that, the, is that the model that, uh, do, I, do I have it yeah, right? Yeah, the, the thing I would wanna make sure is also in there is when you said um, automated, I would also put in optimized. Sure. <clears throat> There's something fundamental about the notion of optimization that I think is key to the, key to the story, key to the model. So, well, the, the, uh, let me, uh, well, okay, I wanna make sure I use this word the same way you do. I mean, so there's two senses of optimized. There's there's local optimization, right? Which is I'm optimized mm -hmm. in this context. And then there's there's lo there's longitudinal optimization in which what I want to do is I want to play the metagame of keeping open my ability to optimize across new contexts, right? This uh, this is like the difference between right being merely logical and then trying to be comprehensively rational in one's life. Right? Yeah, great. And, and what, I, what I would say is is it's it's the former. Yeah, right, and right. it's the, the Leibnizian effort to simulate the latter by virtue of a uh, limit as X, limit as the former approaches the latter. And that I think is where things get really interesting. So is that, so when you equivocate then, uh, I, like, <laughs> I like the idea of a calculus uh, analogy as a form of equivocation, but when you equivocate between actually pursuing the meta-optimality and just folding something into whatever automated system you're using. That's the moment of bullshit. Is that what you're seeing? Yeah. Right? Yeah, so exactly. you're, ident you're, you're identifying two things that are exactly not identical in the important way in that one has the option of renewing your capacity for exploration and innovation, right? And the other has precisely the, the, the effect of keeping you inside your confirmation bias, keeping you inside the, 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 the habitual mode of thinking. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Well, that's very interesting. Uh, that so that that seems like I, we can make a bridge here um, because I don't know if you are, where you are in the series, but I talked in the series about Mark Lewis's model of, of addiction, um, and, and, he, and he talks about it um, as a process of reciprocal narrowing. Um, and let me let me see if this works. Um, it's not it's it's not isomorphic, but I think we, can, we there's something here we can we can make a bridge. So he talks about wanting to uh, undercut the, the normal model of addiction, which is the, the model, the disease model. I have this foreign substance in me and it's just compelling me to behave. And the problem with the disease model is it doesn't, it doesn't situate well with the actual empirical data. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people will spontaneously stop their uh, addiction just because they age, for example. Or you have people like, you know, the Vietnam soldiers that seem to be addicted to heroin when they're in Nam, but when they return, they just spontaneously give up Right, and so the disease model doesn't work very well. And he's got the, the, the model that looks like this. The model is, right, well what happens is I, I, I take the drug and that sort of hampers a, a little bit of my cognitive flexibility in ways. And what that does is that alters, well I'll use a little bit of my language just to speed things up. It alters what I can notice and pay attention to 
So my world, the options in my world shut down a bit. And then as the options in my world shut down, it, instead of breaking, I, I sort of, I, I double down and, and, and I sort of, I, I commit to this world to some degree. And what that does is that commitment actually then reduces my cognitive flexibility, right? And now you've got a feedback loop. As my cognitive flexibility goes down, my, flex, what, my world gets less and less. So you get what he calls reciprocal narrowing until eventually I can't be any different than I am and I see no other options in the world and then that's what addiction is. When I've lost any ability to change my identity and, the, and I see no other alternatives in the world. And that seems to me like what you're describing, like with the American culture, with like with petroleum, there's just, our identities as petroleum consumers, there's no other way we can be, right? And there's no other option for us. We, like, and it's the same thing with people in the Bronze Age or the Mayans with the maze, right? It's like, well, this is who we are and, and this is the only way for us. Is, is that what you're talking about? Because that's very yeah. much a, a, a sort of a, 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 I mean, and Mark, I mean, I, I, I know Mark, um, Personally, his colleague and friend, I think he's. I think. I mean, I think he's brilliant, and I think the work he's doing on addiction is really pivotal. And I think. I think that connection is right then, because that's exactly a kind of bullshitting, right? That's where what you're finding salient is right affecting how you're coupled to the world, and then, right? Then that that impacts on what identities you can take, what course of development you can go through, and then it just narrows all the way down. So are you, are you proposing, it sounds to me like what you're proposing is that something like that is happening in the individual that's getting caught up in simulated thinking. They're basically, right, they're, they, 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 they look like they're um, exploring, but actually what they're doing is this process of intensifying the reciprocal narrowing between who they are and what their world can be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Does that, does that, does that feel? This is very nice. Okay, good. That feels, that feels very right. There's a, there's a, something very large, like a large synthesis that is kind of waiting at the wings. I can kind of feel it around the periphery. Um, yeah, me too. Um, maybe too large again, but yeah, this is good. What the reason that that's in, uh, that, for some reason, because when you go, no, go please. Oh, no, I was just going to say that 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 brings an opportunity to um, make a potential connection uh, that I think is very relevant to your notion of, you know, well, you were talking about this, this open exploratory thing um, and sort of how much we can hold. Um, and I, I propose this to Mark directly because um, I proposed to him, well, the possibility, the actuality, because we have, if this is a good account of addiction, the actuality of reciprocal narrowing um, also means there's a real potential for the opposite, which is reciprocal opening, reciprocal realization, right? Where, um, you know, and, and I, I see this in Plato's model of anagoge, right? I, I get more flexible in the identities I can assume, and that allows me to explore the world more deeply. As I explore the world more deeply, that adds a flexibility to my cognitive grammar. I then, right, so you can see the opposite. You could reciprocally open as opposed to reciprocally narrowing. And the reason why I bring that up is I think what you are trying to do in the kinds of discourse I see you uh, uh, practicing is exactly that. I think you're trying to, I'm proposing to you the following. I, I propose to you that in order to deal with this, the reciprocal narrowing of simulated thinking, you're trying to enact the opposite. You're trying to enact the reciprocal opening. What do you think of that? Yeah, def definitely. Yeah, if you, are you, um, unfortunately, I can't remember the citation of the, the woman whose theory this, this is, but there was a, a philosopher who was building for theory around um, explaining complex systems. Mm -hmm. and and she was discussing the new and maybe it's Alicia Herrera. I don't know who froze here. Uh, no, keep going. Keep yeah, going. exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, Herrera. Yeah. So the, the notion of enabling constraints in yes. how holes happen. Yep. Yep. And and it feels like there's a relationship between enabling constraints or contextual 
uh, constraints and these uh, reciprocal narrowing where yes. there's some some structure whereby there's um, there's some relationship there. And yes, the the, po the place you're pointing is very much <clears throat> in the right direction. And I would say that there's a um, oh, how's this sit? The other point, the key point that you made earlier about the distinction between a local optimization and a uh, more open-ended optimization, yeah. fundamentally, ontologically open-ended optimization, um, needs to be held very centrally as okay. a, um, a proposition in the way that we relate to reality. Um, right. I, you, I think if you intuitively hold the framework, yeah. I was going to say, I think that's really, really cool because, um, that, sorry, it's just resonating with me right now a lot uh, around Plato because the distinction between Plato and Aristotle, as many people have explained it, is their attitude towards wonder. Plato is trying to ultimately uh, expand wonder into awe, right? And whereas Aristotle thinks of wonder as something that you want to remove he identifies it too much with curiosity, right? He wants to remove it through the acquisition of knowledge. Right? Mm. There's a lot of Aristotle's around. <laughs> well, for, for a very good reason, right? He's the foundational figure of science in a lot of ways. I, I, I empathize with that. I empathize with that a lot. Like, is that, are you, are you, John, are you familiar with Ian McGilchrist's work? Yes, of course. I mean, I've talked about it in, uh, in, in uh, the courses when I talk about um, uh, brain lateralization. And I've read uh, also the, the follow-up essay on the, uh, the in, uh, sort of the interaction between um, his idea of uh, hemispheric asymmetry and clearly something that he's articulating as the meaning crisis. And so mm -hmm. I think I, that's... I just thought that that mapped on very well to your, your definition of Aristotle and Plato is, ah. it, it almost sounds like the sort of, yeah, the, the yeah, defined that, left. No, 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 versus, deeply, 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 yeah. because the, the left hemisphere, I mean, so the left hemisphere is basically how you deal with well-defined problems, which fits in very well with a lot of what Jordan's talking about, just so cleanly, right? And when I'm in well-defined problems, what I want is, you know, I want I, attention to detail. I'm pursuing certainty and clarity at all costs because Right when we're both in familiar context, if I can get the details, I'll I'll beat you, because we're both familiar with the context, right? And so, and I want step by step processing because the more I have step by step processing, the more fine grained I can make my behavior, right? And that's the, that's the left hemisphere, and it's great. The problem is uh, you you face a lot of ill defined problems in your life, like predation, right? Right when you know you don't know where it's coming from, you don't know what which kind of predator it's going to be, and so the right hemisphere sort of evolves for, you know, grabbing the gestalt. And it's, it's much more tolerant of ambiguity because you don't care too deeply which kind of predator it is. You know, if it's big and moving towards you, get away from it as fast as you can, <laughs> right? And, 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 and so, but, but what's interesting, right? What's interesting is when you're watching, and this is the work of uh, Bowman and Beeman and others, right, on, on, on insight. What you can see in a lot of people when they have a moment of insight is, right, you'll see a sudden shift in activate. So people are doing a problem, they think it's a familiar problem, and the, the left hemisphere is very dominant. And then when they have the flash of insight, you'll often see a sudden shift of activity to the right hemisphere, right? Because what the right hemisphere is doing, it's doing the meta thing that Jordan and I are talking about. The left hemisphere, it takes a, it's, here's your formulated problem, right? But your set of constraints, it's all stable. And then you're, you're moving through the search space to find the solution. What the right hemisphere is doing is it's not moving through a problem formulation. It's searching through all possible problem formulations to find a better problem form formulation. And when it finds that, and then it ships it back. And why that's important is because I would argue that that notion of, you know, wonder is much more a right hemispheric thing. And, and, and the point about wonder, and, and Fuller makes uh, this point very well in his book, is it's not supposed to bring us to a conclusion. It's supposed to bring us to a connection, which is what I, what was, was why I saw what Jordan was doing, right? What, what you're doing here is he's not trying to bring about, you know, well, I, I need to get more oil, blah, 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 blah. I, I, I got to get, getting this goal is just completely in who and what I am. 
no, it's like, no, the meta thing is, no, 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 no. There's this meta issue of how do I stay connected to reality? And, how, and, and the thing about wonder is it's not solving my particular problems. What it's doing is keeping me open to that connectedness to reality. And so I think there's deep connection. Sorry for that punning on that. I think there's deep connection between what we're talking about and the Grokras work. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and the, and the thing that's in, intriguing to me right now is thinking about the... Um, um, how would we say it? Maybe the sense of holes is a good place. So this is, this is right. now very um, rough, rough language. Like this is Please. raw. Um, this left and, the left and right brain are, we're able to talk about them as distinct things. Mm -hmm. And anatomically, they're in fact actually separated, right? Connected by the corpus callosum, which we, right. can, we can in fact actually physically separate and they still go about doing their thing. Yeah. And yet, for sure, there's a way for them to come together and behave in a fashion which has a characteristic of, of being a certain whole that has a different sensation, a different um, Very much. capacity, a different capacity. Uh, yes. Yep. Um, now, this being a thing, this being a phenomenon in world, um, it's very unlikely that this, this capacity to, to, to do this lives only inside our skulls. Very mm -hmm. unlikely. It seems mm -hmm. absurd to actually propose that. Rather, mm -hmm. it is more likely this is a kind of a general phenomenon that is available more broadly and therefore, and more specifically, is available more broadly among us. Say, for example, oh, right now. I, I agree. I totally agree. That's why I translated um, the McGilchrist language uh, into the distinction between well-defined and ill-defined problems. Groups of people can also face well-defined versus ill-defined problems. Yeah, uh, totally. totally. And, and, and groups of people can behave in a left brain dominant fashion, obligate left brain, right? Mm -hmm. So they can become addicted to that left brain and they can form, uh, a, approach the context they find themselves in as if it is a well-defined context. Yes. This is, this is a, a mature company, right? The, the, the story of the, the innovator's dilemma. The ah. innovator's dilemma is that embodied in a group of people. Right. And also groups of people, therefore by hypothesis can form other ways of being in relationship with each other that respond to the context as being an ill-defined problem. And that is a question mark. Right, yeah. So just to make it, I, I sort of saw a connection here. So you're proposing, right, at, at, at a distributed cognitive level, a level of distributed cognition, you can get a form of bullshitting in which people are equivocating. They're treating an ill-defined thing as if it's still a well-defined thing. And that's another instance of simulated thinking for a group of people as opposed to an individual. Yeah, so let's, let's, let's be very concrete. So let's take a look at it, exactly how this happens, because sure. the equivocation is not, um, you know, the word bullshit, bullshit needs to be taken seriously. Like it's, yes, yes. it works, it's effective. It's, yeah. it's uh, in fact, in many ways, it's actually adaptive for a short period of time. The whole point is that it's adaptive for a short period of time. That's how the advertiser um, gets you to buy the alcohol. Yeah. And, and by the way, the alcohol may in fact make things look better for a few minutes. Yes. Yep. Yep. Um, so I'm in a corporation, I'm in a company and I have a, a, a product, a technology that works really well. And so yeah. and it's making a lot of money. Right. And, and now I'm, by the way, inside my corporation, I'm following my own little mini tater curve. If you think about how these things work, where I right. have a right. well-defined problem, which is the problem domain for which my initial product was init was targeted. Right. Uh, in the context of the ill-defined reality of the larger world that is constantly moving and ebbing, ebbing and flowing and, and uh, changing. Uh, and go ahead. I was going to um, just say, like, I'm just using a concrete example, like BlackBerry or something like that. Give, yeah, give, exactly. Like BlackBerry. Yeah. Perfect. So okay. BlackBerry has a BlackBerry and it's effective and it works and they're making some yeah. money off of it. Um, but of course, the market is changing. So mm -hmm. the context, the context has changed. Um, but the thing they're doing is optimized for a particular context that is no longer the current reality. Yes. Yep. So they have a choice as a company. Right. Do they continue to double down on the structures, processes, technologies, um, distribution channels, organizational structures, models that are optimized for a context that is no longer real, but 
is real enough to actually be able to benefit from high profitability. They can right. extract value from it because they're efficient in, in a context. Yes, very or much. Or do they try to leap back to an innovation mode, right? And of course, what right. we see, interestingly enough, is that it is almost never the case that a corporation chooses to kill the cash cow uh, yeah. and reprioritize becoming uh, responsive to the ill-defined reality that they find themselves in. Right, right, right. Yeah, well, efi efficiency is very seductive that way, right? I mean, I, I've argued in some of my work that, you know, you're always in this trade-off relationship between efficiency and resiliency. And you, efficiency, which, which is often associated with exploiting resources rather than exploring, it's precisely addictive because it, it, it intersects with, um, you know what temporal discounting is, right? Um, this is our bias to find present stimuli mm -hmm. way more salient, most of my language, way more salient than future stimuli. This is why, yeah. you know, when you, that's why it's so hard, this is why dieting has such a massive recidivism rate uh, because the, the goal of losing weight is, is in the future and the chocolate cake is right here now on the countertop. And so, right, the, the problem with local efficiency is it tends to plug into that temporal discounting uh, machinery in, in very powerful ways. So it's like, well, you know, let's just do it another month because we'll still get more cash right now, right? And, and you can do this in experiments. People will take the $10 now rather than the $100, you know, three weeks from now kind of deal. And there's something, again, adaptive about temporal discounting. But again, you need, you need to be aware of it. You need, you need to be able to challenge it. Yeah, and it's, it's particularly maladaptive in, in the domain of accelerating change. Yes, right? yes, if yes. If it's an exponential curve, temporal discounting is, is extinctionary. You just don't know until you're done. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So, so wait, go ahead, go ahead, Jordan. Yeah, so I'm, 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 I'm now having both my, my friend uh, Brett Weinstein's phrase, uh, evolution got us here, but evolution will kill us if we try to use it to get us through here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then I've got your, your language, I think it's your language, of uh, psychotechnologies. Yes. That, yeah. that, that, that seems like that's where we are, which is yeah. that if we continue to try to proceed forward using as our mode of relationship with reality, the structures that evolution put in place to get us here, yes. we're fucked because those aren't responsive to the reality we find ourselves in. Um, I, I think, yep, and the much. solution that we've developed, the, the, the solution that we've developed as humans, which, by the way, is in fact why we are where we are, right? It got us the psychotechnology, the, the invention of psychotechnology is a, uh, the gift that keeps on giving. And it yes. moves us further and further away from the context that gave rise to it in the first place. You know, psychotechnology right. puts us on a very different fitness landscape, very yes. different set of characteristic dynamics. And so we have to actually be able to formulate the psychotech, the meta psychotechnology of engaging in the design of psychotechnology that are in fact responsive to the reality that we are finding ourselves in. And that is a very good oh. way to describe what I'm thinking. Oh, I really liked that. That was really, that really sang to me, the way you just put that. I really liked that a lot. That really resonated with me. That was very clear. That was, that was very insightful. That drew it all together very nicely. So is, is that... Whew. Yeah, that that's very interesting. A very cool, cool way of putting how, it. How would you summarize that, John? Was was that that we need to we need to mindfully or or create our own psychotechnologies to get through? That that's the the key. Piece? Well, we, but the, the the key piece I got out of that is we need to step back and create a, a meta psychotechnology for evaluating how we're designing our uh, our our psychotechnologies, and this is analogous to. Um, in problem solving, how you have to you have to step back and have meta heuristics that look at how you are creating and selecting the heuristics you're going to use. There's a very strong parallel there. And one of the like, and, and think about this. Here's an example of exactly exactly that. You can't you can't logic your way from a weaker logic to a stronger logic. Okay. L what I mean by that is let's if I'm if I'm in predicate logic, uh, which ha which ha uh, you know, has, you know, all uh, or some or something like that um, a, 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 as modifiers. I, I, using the machinery of that logic, I can't work my way up to a stronger logic. There's, you, there's no logical way to do that. I can't go from predicate logic to modal logic because what I have to do is I have to step out of the logic 
I have to step out of the logic and look at how I'm designing my logic. And I have to introduce new axioms that are not found within that logic. Now, the interesting thing about you is you do that in development. You, like as a child, you keep going through those changes where you step outside because you go through qualitative improvement in not only what you think, but how you can think the kind of information processing you can do. And what I saw Jordan doing was proposing exactly that kind of move, where you step out and you say, no, no, we need a meta psychotechnology whose job it is, right? And, and the thing about that is it, 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 it's, it's got to be sort of dynamically self-correcting too, right? Because it's got to keep, it's got to keep open-ended in how it's monitoring the, our, our, how we're designing and coordinating our psychotechnologies. And I find this really relevant because, uh, I, I keep talking about we have to think about ecologies of practices and ecologies of psychotechnologies. We have to we have to think about the relative strengths and weaknesses, all right? And we have to we have to use our technologies in a more ecological way where they compensate and balance and check each other. And what Jordan is proposing is right. No, but what we need is the meta psychotechnology that's sort of like a, like I say open ended. That's actually helping to realize that. That's what I saw as really crucial. Did that help, or did that just make it more convoluted? I'm nodding my head, so everything that you're saying is yes, yes, yes. So, David, did it help? Yeah, I'm. Do you have a sense of what that looks like? A meta psychotechnology? Can you can you make the meta more real? <laughs> yeah. So, so one thing one thing I would argue is is that I think um, that has a lot to do with what I'm talking about when I'm talking about wisdom as opposed to intelligence or even rationality. Mm. So let me, let, me, let, me, let me try and do this concretely, okay? So let's say I have a, a, a particular psychotechnology, right? Mindfulness that helps me do with certain kinds of biases in my attentional processes, right? And what it does is it, it, it tries to keep uh, at bay all of that inferential machinery so I can concentrate on my attentional processes, right? And that's what mindfulness does. Right, but you don't want to. You don't want to permanently shut off your inferential machinery. You need it. So you have another psychotechnology over here called active open-mindedness, and what it does is it prevent, it protects the inferential machinery from all this salience machinery. Because what the what the what the salience machinery is doing is it's helping you make insight. The problem is if I if I let that inappropriately bias my inference, I'll keep jumping to conclusions, right? And that's where you get a lot of bias in your inference. So what do I want? Well. I want active open-mindedness and I want, as a psychotechnology, and I want mindfulness, and then I want them in opponent processing, not adversarial, I want them in opponent processing, kind of like your parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. And so what you do is you have a higher order, right? You have a higher order uh, psychotechnology that's designed to try and coordinate them together and make sure that that check and balance relationship between active open-mindedness and mindfulness is ongoing and adaptive. If, if, if you're having a hard time imagining it, it's not surprising because we don't know how to do it yet in any yes. real, like the, the thing that I'm talking about. Um, mm -hmm. If you can imagine it, well then just please just write it down and let's start doing it because it's very much the thing. <laughs> um, and something that John mentioned earlier in terms of thinking about it in the context of say uh, childhood development or, or human development, mm -hmm. particularly child development, there's a, um, a relationship between the, what we might call the physical layer, the, the anatomical structure, uh, particularly the neuroanatomical structure, but the whole body depending on the specific level of development you're talking about and this capacity to step back from. Of course, uh, yes. And so we might imagine, we might hypothesize that there is something similar to that that is necessary in the context of, of, of distributed cognition for us to be able to have a container, a capacity to be yeah. able to hold a, uh, uh, a meta psychotechnology of this sort. I've got a very simple example. Okay. Um, I've got a computer, right? You've got a computer. We can compute. We can do computation. We both do spreadsheets like nobody's business. Right. Until we have a network, there's a whole bunch of stuff that cannot happen, right? Until right. those computers, yeah. computer, computers can communicate with each other. So a network is a different kind of thing. And there's an entire category of computational phenomena that yeah. only exist in the context of network. 
yep. right? That's, that's an example. So what I'm proposing is that that's actually not just, that's, that's actually a pretty good metaphor. It's a so, great analogy because culture yeah. network brains together long before the internet networked computers together. Exactly. Would and you so, call that an emergent property? Who, who are you asking? Um, both, either. Yeah. I, I, I mean, it depends what you mean. I mean, that's for, I mean, that's a very philosophically loaded term, but it emerges in the sense that it's not found amongst the constituent components. Yeah. Yeah. There's novelty there in the competence of the system. Yeah, the, the, the network not, has. Yeah, the, no, the system, the network can do things that the individual yeah. co computers can't do. And that's the same thing for cultures, as cultures can do things that individual um, Right. So, so you see what happens here, David, is, is there's a, 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 by hypothesis, there's a necessity to find a particular location in culture space, a particular configuration or style or approach to how we go about being human beings together, um, using yes. uh, grammar, uh, yeah. using structures and capacities of being in relationship to, there's a particular the hope, or this is a finger, the fingers crossed is that, that there is one in culture space that doesn't require yeah. some really deep actual evolutionary leap in the biological sense, but that yeah. there's a space in, there's a location in culture space that gives rise to a possibility of a space in psychotechnology space that yeah. is this meta psychotechnology, which then gives us the capacity to engage in meta design against psychotechnologies, which then feeds back on culture space and creates a uh, an escape velocity movement in the overall fitness landscape in the directionality of uh, perpetual openness. So is that, is that a, a sort of referring to the, the uh, collective intelligence concept there? The sort of feedback loops of collecting collective intelligence? Are you asking me? That's something different. I, I was identifying it with work that I do in cognitive science on what's called distributed cognition. Uh, the fact that a lot of our problem solving is done by basically networking brains together via uh, cultural systems. Like, you know, it takes, it takes a network of people, a cultural system to run an airline. It takes a network of people to do irrigation, for example, on, on the kind of scale that makes a civilization possible. Individuals can't, they can't do that for themselves. That's how I was understanding it, um, that, that kind of thing. Uh, I suppose that's a kind of collective intelligence the thing, the, in the sense that uh, systems of distributed cognition can solve problems that individuals just do not have the processing power to solve. And, and I think what Jordan is proposing is that at that level of processing, if you'll allow me the cog silent lingo, we have to find the, the meta psychotechnology that will help us, right, at the cultural level, design psychotechnologies. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? Exactly. Yep, that's exactly it. That's cool. Yeah, and we can and we can point to the various approaches. Like we can actually do a um, an assessment of all the various approaches to distributed cognition that mm -hmm. thus mm -hmm. far have been found, and we can actually uh, determine that none of them can actually get to this location. Like none of them have the capacity. They have a, a variety of different limiting limiting factors on either um, scale scalability mm -hmm. or on the boundary conditions of the amount of, of cognition that's actually available because of um, uh, diminishing returns, for example. Sure. Yep. And um, so we can take a look at the, at the scope of the problem, the, the, the thing we're trying to accomplish. We can notice, notice that the various tools for achieving distributed cognition that have thus far been developed, that have done good work, can't get us there. Uh, and then we can, can say, okay, great. Now we know what we need to do, at least vaguely, is new. And then begin the process of saying, well, how do you design things that are new? Um, and of course, the approach that you, you, you go after is you take a look at what are, what are constraints? What are, what are examples of what a good design would consist of? Yeah. And, uh, and then you do the sort of thing we're doing right, right now, which is you, you notice where there are oh, wow. things that have characteristics like that that you can say, oh shit, that's an example of, of the right kind of thing. Right. So this is analogous, or maybe stronger than analogy, to what I'm trying to do in, in the video series, right? Because I'm doing this whole historical analysis because you're proposing that we have to take a deep look at our history, right? Yeah. To see, right? And then what I'm, I, what I, part of what I'm doing is is is, is trying to, to also build towards something that I, I think you're talking about. So here's a, again, 
we have to use analogies, I guess. Uh, one of the things that makes people good at insight problem solving, this came out of Kaplan and uh, Simon's work, is what's called the notice invariance heuristic. And what you do is you look across all these instances where you have failed to solve the problem and you try, and this is hard to do, and people vary in their capacity to, you try to notice what you're not changing across all the failures. Mm. Uh, beca because mm. that, that's often the thing that you're most blind to, right? And that it's misdirecting what you're finding salient. And if you can notice what's invariant, that can often help you to think, well, it's, it's not an algorithm. It doesn't guarantee anything. But what it does is it gives you a good place to look to intervene for real change. And that can also often provoke the needed insight. Yeah. And so, David, here, um, the, the concept of sovereignty becomes an interesting thing to spend some time on because if you take a look at the, the question of, well, why? Why, why isn't it easy for, for this to happen? Why, why is it um, sometimes quite challenging to take a look at what is not changing across yeah. these different experiments? And you can take a look at just a given, a given individual human and say, okay, well, here's some, poss here's, here's some examples. There's many, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot. Yeah, but one yeah. example might be I have um, a deeply, deeply tied, like limbic system level connection to some aspect of that thing. And so my precognitive processing is actually already rejecting the analysis of that on the basis of an actual fear aversion response to the possibility that investigating in this area might in fact be a threat to my personal physical well-being, right? Sure. Yeah, yeah. And that's a very, very common. And the kind of thing that if you haven't built the psychotechnology, the training, to be able to have enough embodied awareness of those kinds of responses that you can actually notice when that kind of thing is happening, it will come through a blind spot. It'll be an unconscious reaction that will make you just go in circles and never know why you're not actually digging deep because you're simply avoiding it altogether for very deep fundamental and, and these days reasonably well understood uh, psychological reasons. And of course, we can go through a long list of those. There's a very long list of them. Mm -hmm. um, there's and then, of course, you do it not just as an individual. Just to, just to ask, Jordan, would you, would you describe sovereignty as a psychotechnology? Yes. Right. Or some cluster of psychotechnologies that describe a particular capacity to be in response. Sure, yeah. sure, sure. Related. Um, and, and by the way, in, in, as an individual, and then as, as an individual as part of a group. So you can talk about the individual having sovereignty in the relationship with what's happening. And then you can talk about the individual having sovereignty in relationship with other individuals. And then you can talk about that relationship having sovereignty in the context that it finds itself in, right? So it's a, it continues to, to go up and that's where it becomes very challenging. So you know, John and I right now are engaging in a conversation where we're both ready, willing and able as individuals to take yeah. risks with each other. And by the way, to take risks in public, yes. um, which takes time. Like that's not a, that's not a, a, a trivial amount of work to get to the point of being able to do that and not to do it recklessly, right? There's obviously yeah. certain typologies that will simply take risks for bad reasons. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the psychotechnologies of sovereignty bring people into a place where they have, let's by, say by hypothesis, the highest capacity to be able to then do the next level of work to be able to enter into the kind of relationships that give rise to and can begin to discover the, the, the structures, the psychotechnologies that then support the creation of a culture, a distributed cognition mode yep. that itself then is able to finally give rise to the, the meta psychotechnology, which now we're starting to get somewhere. That psychotechnology, which then auto, auto poetically is able to then inform at a lower level of detail and yeah. nuance the psychotechnology structures that give rise to sovereignty and the psychotechnology structures that give rise to a stable form of this, of this uh, distributed cognition. Now we've got a thing. Now that's, that is where we're, we're really getting into a, a good place. Right. I see that. So <clears throat> two things came out for me for that. The first is well, one way we can bullshit ourselves is to keep trying to tra keep equivocating between what you're describing we need to do, which is we need to do this together in a very deep sense of together and equivocating and thinking, no, no, this is an individual sort of theoretical innovation I have to come up with, right? And it sounds to me like, no, no, what? This is something that has to take place 
within distributed, we have to be participating in distributed cognition, not just talking about it in order yeah. to realize it. Uh, that sounded like one of the things you, you, that was an important point. And, and then the other one was, it sounded to me like, uh, be, because of the way you, you, the way you were exemplifying it, that one of the invariants that we're not noticing very well is the fact that we get to tend, we tend to be locked at the propositional individual level as we approach all our problems. And, and it's sort of inconceivable to us that there's a way of solving these important problems that's going to make use of, you know, participatory and perspectival knowing within distributed cognition. Is that also a fair point, the second point? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, this yeah. is um, ubiquitous. In fact, I, I, I found myself experiencing this very concretely um, more than a decade ago when trying to discuss this kind of thing, where mm -hmm. I could actually be in conversation with an individual. I, I did it, it happened so many times that I became, I noticed the physicality, I think I may have described this already, the physicality of it where a point was reached where I could actually see the pupil get wider and then get smaller right. Mm -hmm. as the, I think it's the parasy parasympathetic nervous system is doing that, right? Yeah, pretty um, much. Is essentially, there's something happening where there's a, 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 the building up of an insight and the feeling, the recognition that that insight leads to consequences that are, well, scary. And the individual actually literally goes through a, an almost instantaneous shift and the propositional logic, like you know, again, it's the, it's the uh, you can't build a stronger logic from a weaker logic. Yeah. The weaker logic, is actually able to hold it choose it's able to hold the relationship between the 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 body the in this case the limbic system um it triggers a limbic response to be able to short circuit the inside that is ready to happen and yeah. reboots itself um mm -hmm. what was astounding is that it was almost aphasic where i would actually find myself repeating the same conversation because there was the reboot was was not just a metaphor it was a hard shift in even memory was was not what was not held. So yes, there's a the capacity to be able to be aware of the degree to which our world has put us in a place where we've been so radically separated from many different modes of do you yeah. call it knowing or understanding? I I would call it knowing propositional but that's fine. and participatory hey. knowing. Knowing, yeah. Knowing. Um and I then call, there's a so much so much tied to no, oh, please, please. I, I just wanted to comment on the reason I call it knowing is because I, I want to I want to say that all of them are ways in which we connect to reality. It's not just propositional mm -hmm. not knowledge, which it's claims on truth. You know, procedural has claims of power, uh, perspectival has claims of presence, and participatory has claims of attunement, right? And and these are all these all contribute to our sense of being connected to reality. So I that's why I want to use the word knowing so that. Uh, I, I, I'm not giving one a, a particular privilege. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And the, the path, as I'm sure you're now, like, I don't know how, what happens in the, in the series, but the, the path of, of taking an individual who has been developed in the world we live in, particularly in the West, and by the way, in, in the developed East, um, and how separated our, our environment has, uh, has mm. made us from the, these different modes and Very how, much. Yeah. how separate it's made it made us not just sort of temporally, but separated in a very, very deep way, like a degree oh, yeah. in which we have identity uh, connection or a sense of survival capacity um, by virtue of being one way and not being another way. Uh, yeah, the, it, the path of getting to the point of actually just beginning yeah. to be available. I, I, yeah, that's, I mean, that's what I mean about the, you know, uh, the, the, yeah, the, the, you know, the, the cognitive grammar and the sort of reciprocal narrowing until we've gotten to this point. Uh, yes. Culturally, right? So what, you know, the second half of this, this series is going to try to, you know, uh, unpack this dynamical coupling and, and this trade-off between efficiency and resiliency and the, the, the notion of relevance realization and, and how that is essentially open-ended and is always, you know, uh, we should, our attempts to try and get I'm sorry, I use this term uh, because of its horrible associations. So it's used deliberately. Whenever we try to get a, a final solution 
to what is hmm. relevant or important to us. We're actually doing a, the deepest kind of bullshit because we are thinking that anything can be intrinsically relevant or important, where the only thing that's intrinsic is the ongoing process of finding things relevant and important. And so that's, that's sort of the main gist of the argument and trying to show how, you know, we can, if we can look at what fourth generation Cogsci is telling us, we can see about how it's pointing, pointing us back towards embodiment, embeddedness, extended mind, distributed cognition, a lot of the machinery. The reason why I can talk to you, Jordan, about a lot of this machinery is precisely because of what's going on in fourth, you know, third generation or what's called 4E cognitive science. That's exactly what's going on there as a crucial thing. And then what I try to do with my work is say, okay, this machinery can radically change the grammar by which we understand meaning making and a connectedness to reality. So that's, mm -hmm. the, that's what the second half of the series is going to be doing. Buy your tickets, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, uh, it, yeah, we'll, we'll see, <laughs> we'll see. Um, <laughs> Does this feel like a good place to, to wrap up for, for today? That's, yeah, that's, that's fine with me. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, this is great. Thank you. This is so this is really wonderful. Oh, I, I, I yeah. really enjoyed this too. I mean, I, yeah, really wonderful. I, I, I really enjoyed this a lot. I, I hope we can do it again. Thank you guys. There's some real gems in there. Bye, guys. Thank, you. Thank you, David. Guys. Also, it felt yep. like you're sort of mining, mining a rich seam in real time. So thank you very much for allowing us to, to see that. Rebel Wisdom is a new sense making platform bringing together the most rebellious and inspiring thinkers from around the world. If you're enjoying our content, then you can help us make more by becoming a subscriber, which will give you access to a load of exclusive films. Also, you can then join our group Zoom calls to discuss the ideas in the films, and you can send us ideas for questions for upcoming interviews. We're also looking for talented people to help us out with editing, graphics, music, that kind of thing. And if you're a regular viewer, you'll know we talk a lot about the value of embodying or actually living out the ideas that we talk about. So that's why we run regular events in London. Check out the links on the website for more. And hope to see you soon.